Well, if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 1, I, I'm going to try to, I'm not going to promise, but get through this first chapter. L- let me remind you that the writer is addressing Jewish believers. They have accepted Christ as their Messiah and as their Lord and Savior. But they are facing persecution and suffering and difficulty. And some of them are not moving on in their Christian life. They're still immature babies. Some of them were considering leaving their Christian walk and going back under the tradition and the legalism of Judaism. And the writer is warning them about doing this. He's also presenting them the reality that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And he is therefore superior to everything and everybody. And he's very careful to make this argument. And if I don't keep the context in mind, I'm not going to realize what he's doing. I shared with you last week the first four verses are one sentence in the Greek New Testament. One sentence. And then beginning with verse 5, he begins to move into the reality that Jesus is superior to the angels. And remember that they had, angels had a very elevated position in Judaism because they mediated the Mosaic law. And so forth, therefore they gave them that high position. And now the writer wants them to understand Jesus is far superior to the angels. So why in the world would you want to walk away from a living relationship to Jesus Christ back under tradition and religion and rules and regulations and leave a relationship? We're not a whole lot different today in churches. Because we don't understand our great salvation. And when we get to chapter 2, he's going to move out of the superiority of Jesus to the angels to the reality of what he has given us in Christ Jesus. So it's essential that I realize exactly what he is saying to me. He is declaring to all of these stunted, immature believers, Jesus is far superior to anything, anybody in you. Who is Jesus to you this morning? You sit down and think about that for a moment. Who is he to you? Oh, he's my Savior. Well, he is that, but he's much more. He's much more. And he's the one that has said to every one of us, you are, here's the greatest commandment. You are to love the Lord your God with all that you are. All that you are. Do I do that? Do I love him that way above everything else in my life? And it's easy to get sidetracked with that. And the writer is saying to these Jewish believers, you need to understand the superiority to Christ. Understand we're living in a pagan culture today, folks. Jesus has either been dismissed or replaced are demoted to a lower position than he really is. And it's hard for us to believe that because we are supposed to be in a Christian nation. He is far superior to everybody and everything. And now beginning with verse 5, He begins to talk about his superiority over angels. And here's the interesting thing. And again, keep in mind, angels had a very elevated position in the minds of the nation of Israel because they mediated the Mosaic law. The writer is a brilliant logician. And he will list seven Old Testament passages. Now listen, seven of them. These are Jewish believers. They know the Old Testament. And the writer begins to list seven Old Testament passages that declare the superiority of Jesus over the angels. 
Would I be able to sit down? Have you encountered somebody over the last 10, 15, 20 years that sort of has put angels in an elevated position in their lives? Now, I shared with you before, I walk through the haven, I'll see angels out in yards. You go to Mexico, and you, if you fly into Mexico City and you're driving down to Cordoba from Mexico City about three and a half hours, you can look out into the fields on the side of the road and you can see all of this. And, and we're sometimes just so insulated in a bubble, we don't understand what's going on around us. I've talked about two of those passages. The first, and here is why Jesus is superior to the angels. Number one, because he has a greater name than they. Psalm 2, verse 7. 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. Our Lord is superior because of the title. He has a more excellent name. And remember that excellent name that he has is the Son of God. Now that doesn't mean God, Jesus became the Son of God. It means that in time and space and history... Our Lord manifested that relationship. He was the Son in all of eternity. But when He clothed Himself with flesh, came into this world, He manifested Himself to all of humanity as the Son of God. Ain't no one angel is ever called the Son of God. They're called sons of God in places, but they're not the Son of God. And therefore He is superior because He has a better title. And then from that, he quotes 2 Samuel 7, 14, so that they would understand that this Christ that they have embraced, that they have received, is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises to Abraham about the seed. He has the right to the throne. What a tremendous statement that is. This is the promised Messiah. This is the son of David, and to the nation of Israel, that title indicated to them, this is applied to the Messiah. The problem was they had a wrong view of the Messiah. They wanted a political deliverer. They wanted somebody to come in and take them out from under the bondage of Roman slavery. Now, let me bring that down for a moment. Some of us in this auditorium are in slavery to something this morning. It may be your flesh. You're in slavery to something, and only God can deliver you from that. This is what he wants them to understand. He is greater because of his title, who he is. He is greater, look at verse 6, and he now moves to a third scripture. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, and he's speaking about Jesus at his birth, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. All of them worship him. Now he quotes Psalm 97, verse 7. You can read that on your own. You can turn over there if you want to. Let me just read this, verse 7. Psalm 97, and the psalmist is talking about the power and dominion of God. Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. And in Jewish interpretation, they realized the gods here were not only idols, but these were also angels. Our Lord is superior to the angels because they worship him. They worship him. He's their creator. Boy, that's more than some of us sometimes who profess to be Christians. He is God's firstborn. That means not that he was generated by a human father. He didn't have a human father. He had a body that was conceived in the womb of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, and sovereign, eternal God came into that body and was born. The miracle is in the conception, not the birth. And now, as the firstborn, he is... That is a word of priority and superiority, not that he was firstborn in a family. This is what the writer wants them to understand. And therefore, as the superior one, as the Son of God, he receives the worship of angels. Imagine that, the Creator. He created all the angels. And he's superior to them, and therefore they are to worship him. Now, 
uh, this is the problem when you try to fly through scriptures. It, somebody would say, well, wait a minute. Hasn't he always been worthy of worship? Yes. Yes, he has. He is eternally worthy of worship because he is the eternal, preexistent God. But now the writer is saying at a specific time, and the angels worship him now, but in context here, at a specific time, they're going to again express that worship to him. Can you guess when that time is? Second coming. The second coming. He's coming back. And all the angels will acknowledge that. Even the demonic spirits that have rebelled against him. Uh, uh, a second time he's coming back. And he will receive specific worship at that time. Now let me go down to the next verse 8. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and forever. And the righteous scepter is the, the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And this is an interesting passage of Scripture. He is the creator of the angels. I've just mentioned that. The creator of the angels. And they worship him. Then in Psalm 104, he's quoting verse 4. Let me read this uh, again. Psalm 104, verse 4. He's wanting us to understand who he is. Look in Psalm, the 104th Psalm. He makes the winds his messenger, flaming fire his ministers. Now, what is he saying here? And when we close out this first chapter, angels minister to believers. They are sent from God to minister to you and me. And, and sometimes, and we had that little phrase, angels unaware, you may have entertained angels. You may have entertained an angel and not even known it. That's why it amazes angels how you and I can live the way we live and profess to be Christians. They don't know redemption. He is emphasizing that ain't the changeable nature of angels. They are God's servants. And the word servant that he uses here is the word we get our word liturgy from it. It's a word that's used in the Old Testament to describe the service of the Levitical priest. God created the angels and they serve him. They obey him. They are like the wind and the fire. God is in control of nature. He controls the wind. He controls the fire. They are subordinate to Christ, their creator. That's why he is greater than they are. And we sometimes don't understand that. Boy. Then, here is the next quote that he uses. And this is an unusual one. Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. If you read the Psalms on a regular basis, you'll know that the 45th Psalm is a royal wedding song. It describes the wedding of the king. It's a, a, it's a psalm of beauty and excellence and exalting the one that's about to be married. But then you come to, tucked away in the middle of that psalm, you come to verses 6 and 7. And sometimes we read right through this and don't understand what he is saying. I'm not going to read this whole psalm. In verse 45, 6, Your name, O God, is forever and forever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness. You have hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. This is an interesting passage of Scripture. It, again, is a royal wedding song. It was used at a royal wedding. The verses of this psalm would be quoted. 
But all of a sudden, hidden away in the psalm, in verses 6 and 7, is a bold declaration. A bold declaration that the king is divine. He's God. Wow. Now watch that. The king is addressed as God in verse 6. But in verse 7, he is distinguished from God. We're talking about the Father and the Son. That's why he's superior to all of the angels. And when you look at how this revelation is made in light of the New Testament regarding the Messianic Incarnation, there's no longer any ambiguity or hint of her purpose a hyperbole in the assigning of divinity to the king, it is indisputable. Now, here's where some of us miss the boat because we don't, we don't maybe have access to some Jewish commentators, but the Jews, and these are not Jews who accept Jesus as Messiah, but when they interpret that through the lens of the Old Testament, they realize this is pointing to someone other than just a human being. It's pointing to deity. Now the tragedy is today they're still blind. They don't understand that their Messiah was and is Jesus. But they recognize the fact that this is a psalm of deity. A royal wedding psalm. Boy, what a tremendous, tremendous truth that is for all of us. Do you look at, the, that's why you need to understand some, and I, I don't always do this, but I love to listen to completed Jews on television because they give you insight into scriptures you can't find anywhere else. Because we, we want to impose our Western mind and our thinking on scripture, and you can't do that, folks. You cannot do that. The anxious, ancient Jewish rabbis, would not take the psalm's word at face value and say, oh, this is Messiah, but they would recognize that this is deity that he is referring to. Now, let me take that one step further. This is a royal wedding psalm. What does that mean for you and me? Is there not a wedding coming for the church, folks? Our Lord Jesus is the bridegroom. And one day he's coming for the bride and we will have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow. And that's why you and I need to be faithful to the body down here. Boy, goodness gracious. There is a wedding coming. And God will say to the son, go get your bride. This 45th Psalm is a beautiful, beautiful Psalm. A royal wedding Psalm. Now you see how the writer is building this on logic? This Jewish Messiah that you've accepted is indeed the, the Son of God. And you need to understand to walk away from Him is sheer idiocy. To think that you can put yourself back under rules and regulations and the law and tradition, you're making a serious, serious error of judgment. Here's the next one that he quotes. Let me, let me read that. And I'm trying to fly through this and maybe I'm doing it uh, too fast. Look at verses 9. You have love, right? No, verse 10. And, Lord, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all become old like a garment. And like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Here's the next passage of Scripture that he is quoting. This is from Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. Of old, you have founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. 
the children of your servants will continue and your descendants will be established before you. Now he is building on this previous, previous quote of the 45th Psalm about the deity of God's Son. And now he is saying you worship him because God is immutable. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm so glad God doesn't change his mind. You and I change ours at the, at the drop of a hat. Wow. But God is immutable. He's building on this deity that has been assigned to the Son in Psalm 45. And he is looking forward. Now, f watch this, folks. He's looking forward to the messianic kingdom. He is the son of David. He is the heir to the throne. And there will be a day when our Lord comes back to this earth. Not the rapture when he comes from the church, but when he comes back to this earth, he sit on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem and reign for a thousand years in the messianic kingdom. Boy. And he goes on to tell us that our Lord will have compassion on Mount Zion. And that's another name for the nation of Israel. A future generation, at verse 28, this is amazing. A future generation to come. A people yet to be created will praise the Lord. You pass that on to your children, folks. Do you teach them how to worship? Do you teach them to love the word? How to praise God that every day is to be a day of worship? A day of worship? I'm getting so used to when I'm saying to somebody, well, this, you know, every day is a blessed day when you know, oh, yes, I woke up this morning. Oh, wait a minute. Then I'll come back and say, but if you know him and don't wake up, you know where you're going. We, we just sort of half that, don't we? Half that. Yeah. Do we teach our children then? Do they understand who they are? Are we leading them to that faith in Jesus? I pray every day for my two great-grandchildren. Three, four, however, four. That those two little boys, mother and daddy, would understand the stewardship God has given them to bring those boys up to know Jesus. They are a precious gift from God. A precious gift. And now the psalmist is saying a future generation to come yet to be created will praise the Lord. Now, again, when you read ancient Jewish interpreters... Not coming from a Christian mindset, but from a Messianic, Biblical, Old Testament mindset, they would understand this psalm is referring to the Messianic, Messianic age. And they simply understand God is saying, heaven and earth are going to pass away. Heaven and earth will perish. There is a temporary, finite nature to the creation you and I live in, folks. We don't seem to understand that. And I'll tell you again what I said in Sunday school. You have a chef life. I have a chef life. Only God knows what that chef life is. The older you get, the more you realize, wow, you're deteriorating. Maybe not mentally, but you are deteriorating physically. You're in the process of wearing out. Wearing out. But here's what he wants them to understand. The Christ that you worship is immutable. That's a big theological word. He never changes. He never wears out. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never, ever changes. What a tremendous truth that is. That's a God that I can put my total faith and trust in and never worry that he is going to vary from any of this. As one writer put it, from his yesterdays and eternity past, he has planned not only our todays, but also our forevers. The 
eventual transformation and replacement of the entire created order is coming. One day this world's going to be destroyed not by water, but by fire. He's going to cleanse it. He's going to purify it. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Boy, I need to understand that. And we don't seem to even, that doesn't just seem sometimes to dent our thinking. To dent our thinking. That's coming. It, you know, the way we're headed today, it, it would be better sooner than later to go through all this mess. I don't even want to think about my great-grandchildren, what they're growing up in. I, I don't even want to consider that. have to. I have to. Here's the last. Look at the latter part of Hebrews 1. Verse 13. But which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Uh, if you... I know we've been in chapter 1 for quite a while, but if you can remember, go back up to, to, to verse 5. He's repeating. Here, he's, uh, talk, he's quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1. Emphatically and conclusively closing these seven Old Testament quotes, he's reinforcing the superiority of the Son over the angels. The created angels minister and serve on the behalf of those who have received eternal life. What a wonderful truth that is. And one day, one day we're going to receive more than just living down here on this earth. I need to understand that. He, angels are ministering on behalf of believers. The Son is at the right hand of God the Father today. He's interceding for all of those who've accepted Christ. He is my propitiation, my intercessor. And one day he's going to sit here on the throne of jo uh, David. He will reign and you and I are going to reign with him. That's what Psalm 110 verse 1 is talking about. His return and his reign. His enemies will be defeated. Oh, I, I, I did get through this. and He tells us in that 14th verse. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit eternal life? Mm. Wow. Sake of those who will inherit eternal life. The Old Testament, the writer has brilliantly used the Old Testament scriptures as God's testimony to the superiority of Christ over angels. They are servants of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And he came to be the Savior of mankind. Died our death on the cross. Paid the sin debt. And yet we worship things in our life that are far superior to Jesus. And we don't seem to give it a second thought in a world that is collapsing and being destroyed moment by moment by moment by moment. Wow. So I'll ask you again this morning. What position does Jesus have in your life? You don't have to acknowledge that he's Lord. He's Lord whether you acknowledge it or not. The question is, is he your Lord? Have you come to that place? If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, your first step is to acknowledge that you are a sinner separated away from God. And that Christ paid the sin debt. Your religion or tradition will never, ever bring you into a relationship to God. It is only through his son, Jesus Christ. If you've never, ever done that, then this is the moment. The Holy Spirit is speaking very clearly through his word. He is superior to everything and everybody. God has fully and finally revealed himself in his son Christ. 
He is your Savior, your substitute, your sin bearer. Trust Him. I invite you to pray this prayer as we do every week. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I invite Jesus Christ into my life. I accept him. I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. If you prayed that prayer and you're here in the auditorium this morning, you can come down to the front and, and make that public. Or if you are watching online, you prayed that prayer, you can let us know. We'd be delighted to hear from you. What place does Jesus hold in your life this morning? If you are a believer, is he the superior Christ, Master, Lord of everything? He is Lord of all, folks, or he's not Lord at all. You, you can't compartmentalize him. You cannot. He is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. Wow. As Debbie leads us in this hymn of commitment. Share Jesus with somebody. Let me leave you with this. I was sharing Wednesday night about the uh, lady softball and the uh, Super Regionals in baseball presently going on. Oklahoma won the state, the uh, World Series championship for the women. What you don't know, their coach is named Patty Gasso. There's a nice, wonderful article about Patty. She has won more honors than you and I could ever think about. And yet she states emphatically that she is more interested in winning souls than softball games. Amen. And I was listening to the players after that game. And almost every one of them, except one, almost every one they interviewed gave God the honor and the glory. And I thought, what an influence from a coach. We can't even do that sometimes in our families are in our sphere of influence. We never know how far that goes. We'll continue our study of the revelation tonight. And, and as we leave today, share Jesus with somebody. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you that you are who you say you are. And I pray that for one listening or here has never trusted you, your Holy Spirit would bring them to that place when they acknowledge who you are and what you've done and receive your gift of eternal life. Bring us back tonight to hear you speak again through your revelation. In the strong, powerful, precious name of Christ we pray. Amen.